Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Clifford Young, President of Ipsos Public Affairs in the U.S. Cliff, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ellen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C. I'm actually in the basement of my, um, my house. Um, a little scraggly for those of you that know me. I haven't had a haircut uh, in about, you know, 10 weeks or so that I'm using gel. I decided to grow out a bit of my, my facial hair. I'm not doing a very good job. I'll probably cut it off tomorrow. Um, but that's what it's like. It's been like in COVID-19. Um, I, I run public affairs at Ipsos. Uh, you know, basically our remit is the public sector that is doing policy work for governments, um, the federal government included, as well as polling and dealing with societal issues for private sector uh, clients and, and third sector clients. Uh, today, very quickly, what I want to do is give you a broad-based overview uh, of the pandemic of America today um, in this COVID-19 world. Um, I want to start with broad context, uh, talking about how our world has changed from a public opinion standpoint. Um, then I'll go into more specifically talking about behavioral changes, um, some of the things we might expect in the future. And finally, of course, because I'm a professional pollster, um, we're going to look at the 2020 elections, um, uh, which are coming up uh, in, in the next little bit. Uh, so very quickly, um, let me just quote myself. It's kind of ironic. This is actually a quote I gave um, to Axios uh, about 10 weeks ago. Uh, but I, I can't overstate it as a professional pollster and, and trained social scientist. Uh, never before in history, uh, whether it be American history, global history, have we seen such a widespread, pervasive, and profound forced behavioral change that really reshaped our world, whether that be for the long term or the short term, we can talk about that, but it was absolutely unprecedented. Um, obviously, it shapes the contours of, of our world today. It will leave certain imprints on humans' minds, on Americans' minds, which will affect politics, economics, and other spheres and domains of our world. Um, but uh, it, it was profound, and let's reflect a bit uh, with data. Uh, the other point I make, because I also am uh, a professional forecaster, is that we have to be very, very careful about doing forecasts, about predicting the future at this point. Um, the question is, will these imprints be long-lasting? Are they permanent? Are they more short-term? That's very difficult to determine today. Um, we'll give you some, I'll give you some insights, at least from my perspective when it comes to politics and other sort of related issues, what we think. Um, but let's get into the data, because I think the data speaks for itself. So, so very quickly, the first thing I could say is the pandemic has completely reshaped uh, uh, Americans and voters' priorities, sense of what is important. Um, and like I said, the data speak for themselves. First and foremost, this first slide, uh, we're seeing um, a week over week, uh, over the last, uh, course of the last month, we pinned some weeks out here and there. Um, this is based upon a global study, but it's looking at COVID-19 um, as a priority, as a, as a threat, um, as we can see, whether it be in the United States, whether it be the global average of approximately 20 countries, whether it be China or Italy, which were the two sort of, let's call them, reference points we use to understand the pandemic and as it rolled out. This is very, so very, very high on Americans' minds and global citizen minds in general. Um, we're going to see this reverberating throughout the data um, during this presentation, that Americans, that people are still worried about the health risk, and this is clouding or filtering the way they see the world at this point. So first and foremost, high threat still. Second, the pandemic has reshaped our priorities. And so what are we looking at here? We're looking at what, what are the main priorities in America today? Um, what do, do voters, what does public opinion, what do American adults in general uh, think about and prioritize and worry about? Um, what I often uh, said prior to COVID-19 was that we had a troika or three issues in the United States. We had jobs in the economy, healthcare, and immigration. You can see in the little table here, um, the fact that those three issues were basically tied. One would go up, another one would go down, but they were basically the three primary issues. Healthcare was much more of a Republican issue. Immig excuse me. 
immigration was much more of a, of a Republican issue, healthcare much more um, a Democratic issue, and economy and jobs was sort of had no partisan stripes. Then comes the pandemic and health, health care, people worrying about the health crisis shot up in terms of importance. Economy and jobs kind of trailed. So you have these two issues. And now what we're seeing is as even though it's still risky in people's minds, the health crisis, the virus, that's receding a bit, and people are increasingly focused on jobs and the economy. Um, we'll still have these two issues sort of competing with each with themselves, with each other. We're going to see this for the elections when we look at the kind of look at the elections and we contextualize the elections. But right now, it's really a jobs, jobs, jobs agenda for Americans not just Americans, by the way, but global citizens. If we look at the same data across countries, we'd see the same sort of pattern. Old issues fall by the wayside. Healthcare and jobs and the economy rise up in importance. Then the jobs and the economy as the economic woes uh, unfold become increasingly important. That will shape the way uh, voters and consumers see the world into the near future. Now, talking about jobs and the economy, we're, we're, here we're looking at consumer confidence. Uh, we're looking at a time series back to 2001. This is the Ipsos time series in the United States. Uh, what we see is a precipitous decline 10 weeks ago in consumer confidence. But there's a, there's a point I want to note with this time, time series um, is that we still are not the, at the lowest point um, of our time series. Our lowest point of the time series was at the worst period or worst point of the Great Recession. Um, there's a reason for that. I want to come back to that a bit uh, because um, – there's an interesting aspect uh, to consumer confidence today, um, but obviously um, a stark and significant drop in consumer confidence, which is highly correlated um, with future uh, consumer spending, as we know, whether it be in the United States or in other countries. We've done that sort of econometric analysis. Um, but like I said, consumer confidence, while it has tanked, um, it still is at, not at the lowest point as it was, was um, at the lowest point of the Great Recession. The question is why? And here I kind of want to emphasize that. So this is an additional question we added um, to our tracker. We're basically asking if Americans believe that the economy will re recover quickly or not. Um, what we see here is approximately half, a little bit less than half of Americans uh, believe that the economy will recover quickly. Um, when we cut the data, that is the confidence data, the consumer confidence data, by this question we see almost a 15 to 20 point difference between those that believe that there'll be a fast recovery versus those that do not believe there'll be a fast recovery. I've been calling this a, a irrational exuberance in part. Um, part of the reason why consumer confidence is still relatively high compared to the Great Recession, even with 40 million plus jobless claims, is that a significant chunk of America uh, still believes that there'll be a fast economic recovery. Obviously, we don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, I would say probably it'll be slower than what people think, though I'm not an economist. I do believe that the health crisis has imprinted on our heads, in our minds, um, notions of social distancing and other sort of countermeasures to keep ourselves safe. Uh, that will affect, obviously, the economy looking forward. But that said, the numbers in a relative sense, the consumer confidence numbers, are buoyed uh, by um, this this optimism about a fast recovery. That will be very important because it's a linchpin for understanding politics as well, which I'll come to, but a very interesting characteristic um, of this dynamic at this point. And finally, before I go into the next section, which is talking about behavioral change, what I wanted to do was point out the real sort of uh, 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 matchup or juxtaposition of issues. The huge question today, obviously, is whether we, sh we should keep in the shelter in place, the stay at home, the self-quarantining, um, doubling down on the health issue, protecting ourselves from a health perspective, minimizing the effects of the health crisis versus opening quickly up or opening up, uh, you know, you know uh, easing the stay at home restrictions so the economy can come back. What we still see today, and we've asked this question in a number of different ways. This is just one example of a question we ask. Still a vast majority of Americans are more worried about their health and the health crisis than they are about the economy. So they're increasingly worried about the economy because jobs have gone away, people have been furloughed, people have either lost their jobs or no people have lost their jobs. But the health crisis and worrying about one's health and, uh, and, and one's family's health 
is still paramount today. And this will be important for understanding the dynamics of politics in the United States um, when looking towards 2020, which I'll come back to. So very quickly before I get into behavioral change and risk, um, you know, still the virus is seen as a high level of threat, whether it be in the United States or globally. The pandemic has restructured the way voters and Americans see the world at this point. It was healthcare and the economy and jobs. Now it's jobs, 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 economy, increasingly so. Um, that said, that said, there's still an emphasis when placed against each other to be safe and cautious, not to ease up too quickly. It's not about revving up the economy. It's about keeping people safe. Um, and lastly, while consumer confidence has tanked, has declined significantly, why? Because of obviously um, the effect of the pandemic. Uh, it's still being buoyed by what? Um, a certain degree of optimism, at least by half the population, that there'll be a, a fast recovery. We, we don't know if that will be the case or not. Um, I would say if there is not a fast recovery, we might have fantasy or, or, or wishful thinking meeting reality, um, which could level set and reset these numbers, which could have a, uh, an additional effect. But let's kind of bracket that, and if we want to talk about it in Q&A, we can come back to it. The next section is basically, basically behavioral change and risk. So broad context, we saw how priorities have changed, what has changed on the behavioral, um, the, the behavioral side and the risk perception side. I'm not going to share all the data that we have. This is some data from our Axios Ipsos tracking poll. But, but, but suffice it to say, I just took two indicators from maybe 30 indicators. Um, but what we saw at the sort of um, the height of, of self-quarantining, you know, about 90% of people visiting their friends and family, that is people not venturing out into the COVID-19 world. Increasingly so, we're poking our heads out, as I like to say. We're going out and meeting family and friends. We're moving out in safe ways. Um, we're still social distancing. We're wearing masks. The super majority of Americans are still doing that. Um, but, you know, as spring gets more sunny and, and things get nicer, and the signals are more positive when it comes to the pandemic, people are beginning to venture out. And these are just a couple of indicators kind of reinforcing that point. That said, there's still a sense of risk. Now, this risk has declined over time. Here we're looking at, you know, how much risk to your health and well-being do you follow in each of these activities. We can see that there's a decline over time, um, more, but there's still a relatively high level of risk. 64% sense of risk for those meeting in-person gatherings with family and friends, 68% still returning to your normal pre-COVID or pre-coronavirus life. Um, that's down. Both of these are down. All of these are down um, to some extent, uh, but there's still a sense of general risk. As I was saying before, Democrats and Republicans, there is a partisan difference in this notion of risk. Um, the question is why. Um, there's a twofold reason. First and foremost, Democrats tend to live in urban places that were most affected by the virus, Republicans less so, and not necessarily rural, but less urban places. In addition, they consume different sorts of media. Um, you know, uh, your, your left-leaning media tends to focus on the urban uh, trials and tribulations of the virus. Uh, the more conservative media tends not to, tends to focus on exactly where those more conservative people live, which are in less urban places. So whether it be through media consumption and a combination of that with, um, with actually where you live, this has sort of uh, shaped the way, from a partisan perspective, how uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, see the world and actually even perceive risk. Now, just to kind of go back to and talk about sort of quarantining or the lack thereof, what are we looking at here? This is another cut of the data. This is from our biosurveillance atlas, where we're tracking real time with uh, aggregate cell phone data, social media data, and other sort of real time inputs. Um, the relative adherence or, uh, to social distancing. Um, here is how far you ventured from your home. Here we have sort of April 6th to, uh, 6th to the 12th versus May 18th to the 24th. Um, you know, A grade is like dark, uh, dark blue or the bluish color, and F grade, a lower grade, is, is the brownish color. And as we can see, as we can see, the world's opening up, obviously much more focused, more rural, less urban places, more red places indeed. Um, the urban places still, whether it be, let's say, in, in the New York area or maybe California as examples, uh, still are mostly blue. 
but but just another indicator that reinforces the the, the poll-based indicators we're seeing is that Americans are beginning to poke their head out, um, venture out uh, further into this sort of new COVID-19, uh, not quite post-COVID-19 world, uh, but this new open COVID-19 world. Just to reinforce this sense of sort of relative risk, this is just another cut, just telling the same story. What's your notion of risk? We're doing all of these sorts of things, traveling on airplane or mass transit, 88%. Dying in a restaurant, 74%. Attending a sporting event, 83%. These are just examples. Attending an in-person event, 85%. Uh, taking a vacation, 75%. So still a heightened sense of risk out there. Um, we've shown a number of slides just reinforcing that. So on the one hand, people are poking their head out. They are venturing out. They are um, going further away from their homes increasingly, as we saw by those maps, the comparison, the juxtaposition of those two maps at two different time, time points, but there's still a sense of risk. Um, and, and what I can say is, once again, I'm, a, I'm trained not, not just a pollster, but I'm trained as a behavioral scientist as well. Um, it's hard to predict. Uh, you can have sort of models of frameworks to try to predict. Um, but what I can say un unequivocally is the health crisis has imprinted in our heads, in our minds, something um, for many of us, um, this notion of heightened risk and certain sort of behaviors that are associated with it, whether it be not going and hanging out in large groups, wearing a mask, um, standing six feet from people, one in a line or one in a queue, these sorts of things probably will stay around. There's a lot of other sort of tangential things related to that. Um, but definitely we saw with SARS in Hong Kong, we could expect that looking forward, that when one way or another people's behavior will be affected um, by what I would call the health crisis imprint. Just to reinforce, I guess we just, I just want to tell the same story. This is another data point we, we showed in terms of risk, um, just reinforcing large events. 24% of Americans said they go to a, sports, uh, a sporting um, event right now. 24% uh, said that. We did this for 538, one of our other sort of media partners. Um, what would get you to go back? 63% say vaccine. By the way, independent of the domain we look at, whether it be sports or going out and shopping, working, um, sending your kids to school, um, having a vaccine out there isn't necessarily the necessary condition to get people to go back, but it's a very important sort of facilitating factor for people feeling, feeling safer. Obviously, countermeasures are important wearing masks, uh, gloves, uh, uh, six feet, social distancing, et cetera. But, that, but the vaccine, independent of the domain specifically, um, is super uh, important. So summing up, high level risk. The risk uh, is variable across different sort of activities. Um, vaccines are important, but other sort of social distancing measures are as well. That said, people are beginning to venture out. Uh, they're doing it in a cautious way. Um, but they ultimately are, and we saw that with a number of sort of different data cuts, whether it be from polling or other sort of non-polling based uh, metrics or estimates. Two more sections and we're done. Uh, I wanted to get into politics a bit. Um, our our COVID-19 world is very, very partisan. We were very partisan before we went into it, extremely tribal, highly polarized world. Um, we see this replicate or manifest itself again in the COVID-19 world, excuse me. Um, here we're just looking at relative uh, notions or, or sense of, of concern uh, about COVID-19, about the virus. We can see fairly large partisan differences, um, 30 points. These are huge. Now, once again, it, it might be a function of our media consumption, as I was saying. It might be a function um, of where we live or a combination of the two things, but very, very different life experiences in a relative sense. Um, we really see these partisan dis differences uh, manifesting th themselves, especially at the federal level, that is the U US government, the Trump administration. We can see over time that people have lost trust uh, in the federal government and their handling um, of, of the pandemic. Uh, we see whether it be uh, independents or Democrats, a precipitous decline over time, something like 20 points, a little bit less, maybe 15. Um, Trump and, and the administration have held kind of steady with partisans, that is Republicans, uh, but huge, huge partisan differences. We're looking at 40 points um, in the most recent sort of iteration or wave of our poll. 64% uh, of, of, of Republicans are trustful, only 23% of Democrats, so only 37% of, uh, of independents. This is important because it's become highly partisan. 
uh, the perceptions of relative efficacy and efficiency of the government in relationship to dealing with the issue. Um, this will have implications for the election in my mind, especially among independents, which will be key, especially in key swing states for defining who actually ultimately uh, wins and takes the White House, whether it be Trump keeping it or Biden taking it. Um, on, on the state government side, they fared much better, a much lower partisan differences, uh, slightly some, but Republicans tend to be less trustful of government in general relative to Democrats. Um, they've been really front and center, that is the state governments and governors. I would say overall, they've gotten really good grades. Um, we actually did a, a Washington Post poll a couple weeks ago grading states, and for the most part, all states were above 50% approval ratings in dealing with the pandemic specifically. The federal government, the Trump administration, faring much more poorly. Excuse me? So we can, we can see sort of in a general sense um, huge partisan differences, kind of the tale of two Americas. And what I want to point out as well, and this is just one data cut, but we have a lot of different things we've done with different media partners looking at it. Um, it's not just a tale of two partisan worlds, that is red and blue, uh, but there's a rich and poor, and there's a white and non-white um, a, a differential experience and impact when it comes to COVID-19. Here I just want to point out um, a couple data points you know, about 25% of non-whites, that is, you know, non-whites um, know someone that, that uh, has died from the, the virus, only 10% of whites. Um, that's just a proof point, an indicator. We can cut the data with other metrics uh, the same way and find the same sort of uh, differential experiences, but huge uh, uh, disparity of experience, inequality of experiences when it comes to uh, COVID-19. Uh, so just to sum up before I get in the last section and I'm done, um, ultimately, I want to show kind of the tale of two Americas. Mostly, I wanted to focus on showing that the partisan, hyper-partisan world that existed before COVID-19 persists into uh, uh, the pandemic era. Um, in some ways, it's gotten worse. Some of the partisan differences are even bigger. There will be certainly implications for the general elections, which I'll talk about in a second here. But when we think of tale of two Americas, it's just not partisan. It's just not red or blue. It is, it is white and non-white, it's rich and poor. Uh, dep independent of how we cut it that way, we see that Americans are having a really, you know, a, a real differences in terms of their experience. Um, I didn't show you sort of more affluent versus less affluent Americans, but obviously you can imagine what the data says. More affluent, Ameri more affluent Americans are doing it from home. They're engaging the world virtually. Less affluent Americans either have lost their jobs and furloughed or are having to go out into the COVID-19 external world and, and bear the brunt of it. Uh, some of the data we already saw kind of suggested that. But once again, there's a tale of two Americas, but there's multiple tales uh, 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 of differential experiences or tale of two Americas. And lastly, before we kind of sum it out, like what is, this is the context. This is our world today, right? Um, and so how will this impact uh, the 2020 elections? And so, um, so what do we think? And let's just start with some basics. Um, like I said, I'm a professional forecaster, uh, election forecaster, but, but a forecaster of politics. Uh, the most important indicator for me is appro our approval ratings. Um, obviously, you can put other things into your models, but, but approval ratings are the most important. Um, what we know based upon a large data set of elections at Ipsos is that a sitting executive, in this case a sitting president, um, with a 40% approval rating or better, has better than a 50-50 chance of winning. Um, so, you know, Trump is not in an awesome place, but he's not in a horrible place. Um, he's above 40. This is sort of where he's been, I would say, since uh, the passing of the tax reform bill. Um, a little bit above 40. Uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, he got into the mid-40s and even in, in a couple polls in the high 40s. Uh, but this is where he's been hovering, sort of historically speaking. Uh, like I said, this isn't a dominant place to be, but this is in a, you know, a reasonable place to be for, for an incumbent. And if it doesn't put him in the driver's seat, it puts him in a pretty good place. So what does this mean if we, we you know, go look at a data more specifically? Okay, and here what we're looking at um, is basically his approval rating. He has, you know, 41% approval rating to date. That's the Ipsos poll. 
And if we look at our model, once again, a model based upon uh, a thousand plus elections around the world, we see that at a 40% uh, approval rating, an incumbent, and that is what Trump is, an incumbent has about a 55% chance of winning. So he's in a pretty good place. He's been hovering between 40 and 45 points, uh, point approval ratings, um, which puts him, like I said, not, if not in a dominant place, in a reasonably strong place. Um, I think it's interesting you look at the successor. So the successor would be, let's say, Hillary Clinton um, in 2016. Barack Obama had about a 50% approval rating. She only had a 28% chance of winning. Uh, that let's you know that's the past obviously, but the models were suggestive of a very competitive election, which it was. Uh, but once again, um, uh, Trump is in a strong place, if not a dominant place. Now, you know, uh, we initially sort of set up the I would say the the analytic uh, the analytic um, uh, uh, schematic, let's say, to understand the election. And I asked a very simple question: Will Trump be uh, a wartime president, that is, will people rally around the flag and will his approval ratings go up, or will he be a depression president and his numbers will tank and he'll be basically shoot out, right? And actually, he's neither been one nor the other to date. He's just sort of a partisan president, right? And so the simple answer is there was a slight rally around the flag effect um, at the beginning of the pandemic as things became uh, were shut down. Um, but, you know, he had a little bit of a bump, maybe a five-point bump, across all polls, not just the Ipsos poll, but ultimately he lost some of that, 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 that shine or bluster. Um, he's back down to sort of historic averages. And I would say right now he's being buoyed by um, his, his partisan base, which you know Republicans approve of him at about 85%, 90%. Um, and so he's a partisan president at this point. Now the question is, um, what happens if there's not a fast economic recovery, and this is why he's crazy like a fox. He realizes that. Um, a majority of the Republicans believe that there'll be a fast economic recovery. Um, so he, there's probably headwinds in the near future if the economy doesn't bounce back like many Republicans believe it will. Remember, those consumer confidence numbers are not as low as they were in the Great Recession still, and that's being buoyed by what I call irrational exuberance among about half the population, most of which are Republican, believing in a fast recovery. So the point being is, right now he's a partisan president, kind of at his historic average, puts him in a reasonably good place, um, but there are headwinds looking forward um, as the economic, if and probably when, um, or as uh, the economic woes sort of unfold. Last, uh, last two slides, and I'm done. I don't like horse race polls at this point. Um, that is, you know, the matchups, uh, I think we're pretty, pretty far out. Right now at the national level, Biden has a lead over Trump. Um, you know, I, I, I would say it's, it's still probably a 50-50 election, though Trump does have headwinds, as I was saying, especially when it comes to the economy. I wouldn't read too much into this. They're not great predictive sort of uh, instruments um, at this point. Uh, but what I would look at, if you want to look at things, excuse me, and let me just skip on to the last slide, um, are, 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 are the key swing states. Now, maybe there's seven or eight or so, but let's focus on three, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Um, those three states Trump took. That's how he took the White House. Um, and we have a tale of two, uh, of two elections. Um, if we look at his approval ratings and we look at their relative probabilities, given the approval ratings, he's in a fairly good place in each of those states. On the flip side, if you look at the matchups, um, he loses to Biden in each of those states. Um, I'd probably take the average of the two and say probably it's 50-50. There are headwinds for Trump. The economy doesn't look good. He might get through it. Um, but really focus on these three states um, if he – if he loses one or two, plus another one, let's say for sake of argument, Arizona is an example, um, or Florida, obviously, um, Biden will take the White House. But I would focus on these key swing states because ultimately elections in the U.S. Um, are not nationally based. Uh, they're based about a 50 state elections. So let me just sum it all up and I'm done. So the virus, the pandemic, is still seen as a risk by Americans and by global citizens. Um, it has restructured uh, Americans' view of the world. Health is a concern, but increasingly it's jobs in the economy. Um, when you juxtapose jobs in the economy vis-a-vis -vis health, it's still about people's health, people's, the family, the health of people's family, 
Um, they want to keep things locked down longer and ease up slower, they easing up things more quickly uh, for the economy. That's very important. That's a very important political dynamic. People are beginning to poke their heads out into the COVID-19 world, though they're still scared, they're angst-ridden. Um, you know, a vaccine is very important, though they're going to be engaged in other sorts of uh, countermeasures like wearing masks, gloves, and social distancing to protect themselves. But a vaccine is key, and this is a key, by the way, across multiple domains. I showed you sports, but it applies to education, um, jobs, shopping, and other sorts of uh, other sorts of um, uh, behaviors. Uh, ultimately, highly partisan world. There's a tale of two Americas. It's been exacerbated by COVID-19. That said, um, that said, it. Uh, there, there's also, you know, the tale of other sorts of Americas, whether it be affluent, not affluent, white or non-white. And finally, uh, Trump looks to be the partisan president. He's kind of held his own. Um, we'll see if he keeps that uh, looking forward. It's probably a 50-50 election at this point. I know that's not a – I'm not really taking a risk there saying that. But even the key swing states, the indicators are at odds with each other. Uh, though he does have significant headwinds, and I think that – um, if the economy doesn't recover as quickly as people think it should, he might lose some of his partisans because they're the primary uh, Americans who believe or people who believe that there will be a fast recovery. Uh, so in sum, thank you, and I'll hand it over to Frank. And, Frank, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Cliff. Hey, Cliff, maybe just one question for you that uh, somebody, and I think it's relatively easy, is um, do you see any differences in optimism between demographic groups is it a younger thing? Anything that you could add that I think would be helpful? On the consumer confidence side? Yes. Yeah, and so uh, we see basically the more affluent, the, the, the more affluent are, are more optimistic, obviously. Um, we also see uh, that, that the urban, um, that the urban people are less so optimistic because they're being hit by, you know, the primary impact of uh, the pandemic. Those that live in less urban areas are more optimistic. Um, the more educated, obviously, uh, like the more affluent, that is those that have more, more income, tend to be more optimistic. The younger are always more optimistic, but not necessarily when it comes to consumer confidence specifically, because they've been massively impacted, especially those going on to the, the workforce, so they're less so. I wouldn't say there are huge demographic differences when it comes to consumer confidence. Um, that's an indicator that shows less differences. We're not seeing 40-point differences like we do in politics, uh, but that's the, the basic trend. Okay. I think the question comes really from the automotive community really trying to understand there's mixed messages. There's messages about people losing jobs, financial risk, and so on. And then on the other side, you're hearing about this need to buy cars, um, to move away from public transportation. You know, so in some sense, uh, one counter to the other. And uh, I think they're, they're, you know, either whether it's an, looking for an optimistic point of view or not, it's just trying to, to wrestle with that conflict. Yeah, I, I, but I think there's conflicting things going on. I think, and you and I talked about this yesterday. Um, on the one hand, what we can say is not, not definitively or not specifically, but there is going to be this health crisis imprint on our minds. And it's going to affect the way voters and consumers think about things. And so whether that means buying a car instead of using public transportation, can't say that specifically, but the social distancing sort of uh, countermeasures that we've uh, implemented as individuals and as a society are going to be sticky in one way or another. On the flip side, so that's positive, I guess, for the, for, for the auto industry. Um, uh, on the negative side, you know, no one's going to want to be making big ticket purchases right now, right? Because, you know, the primary logic of consumer confidence is, you know, I'm not confident if I don't believe I'm going to have a job in six months because I can't pay for things. And I'm not willing, I'm not willing to make big ticket purchases, um, you know, because I'm not quite sure and I'm unsure about my job. Um, and that's very, very clear. We have sub indicators and some indices on our consumer confidence index um, and big ticket items. We had a kind of a, a basket of items all tanked. Um, and so you have those two points, right? On the one hand, in the short term, short to medium term, people are worried about their jobs and therefore are going to be less bullish about a big ticket item. On the flip side, you have, you know, this health crisis imprint that could change uh, the way people think about public transportation and other group-based forms of transportation. Okay, great. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, and again, thanks. I actually pulled Cliff out of a, an executive meeting for this one hour. So a little bit different, you know, I, I know it's necessarily not uh, uh, exactly automotive, but obviously there's implications on auto as well. Thanks, Cliff. But it was well, fun, right? That, 
There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so while while we're okay, loading baby. the next deck, um, I think that'll take a couple of minutes. I'm going to just answer a few other just kind of administrative type questions. We get we're getting a lot of questions around access to the deck. Uh, the way it works using this platform is um, people who have a permit or registered will be sent a, a notification of the link is available. Um, that typically takes a couple of days to happen. Um, so um, hopefully that answers that question. And then there's a, a lot of questions kind of around um, forecasting expectations, which is a, a great lead into our next speaker, Jeff Schuster, who will uh, provide you a lot more detail on that. So um, with that, I'll let these guys load it up, and um, we'll, we should be starting in uh, about five to ten minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 